And uh, now I want to introduce our next speaker, our next guest, uh, who is Gadimina Stramanauskas, Global Privacy Director and Senior Counsel at Tapestry, uh, which company group portfolio includes such luxury apparel brands as Coach, Kate Spade, and Stuart Weitzman. Hello, Gadimina. Hi, everyone. Hi, Bigley. <laughs> uh, when putting together a program for this conference, uh, I thought about Gediminas as a person who could best describe uh, how a global company deals with its international data flows and how the daily work of a global privacy director looks like. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, Gediminas, uh, our audience is full of data protection enthusiasts uh, who are one way or another way have very different questions related to data privacy at their desks on a daily basis. So what questions do you solve on your daily basis and how did you get there where you are today? Uh, sure. I mean, thank you for your question. First of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to all the privacy professionals for hard work in this field. Uh, and I'm happy to be here and I'm happy that everyone is healthy and safe. Uh, from my perspective, I manage global privacy compliance. Um, I'm based out of New York. Uh, first of all, of course, I'm a lawyer. I'm the Lithuanian bar and, and U.S. New York bar attorney. Uh, so I see it from the compliance perspective, but of course, I'm an advisor of a business. So I'll try to advise business to, you know, to be up to speed on the privacy compliance. Uh, in the daily activities, I focus on two major privacy laws, of course, GDPR and CCPA. Uh, for, for people who are not in privacy field, GDPR is General Data Protection Regulation and CCPA is California Consumer Privacy Act. These are two key, the most comprehensive privacy world, uh, laws in the world. So I develop privacy program based on those laws. Um, I, let's say, manage all the privacy risks. I perform privacy impact assessments, uh, you know, help with data subject requests. Like if, if our customers are requesting to, let's say, access their information or delete that information, have to comply and honor those requests. Uh, of course, contracts, I mean, I unified contractual practices um, review privacy clauses and, and engage in, you know, multiple uh, activities related to the privacy. And, uh, you know, the position is quite interesting because, uh, of course, we have uh, uh, sales and distribution across the globe. So we have um, corporate colleagues across the globe and uh, retail stores across the globe. So, for example, we have, um, you know, people in Japan, China, Singapore, you know, Australia, across Europe, U.S., so I think privacy field, first of all, is very, very interesting for me because it's ever changing. The rules are changing. So for the privacy professionals, you have to have a curious mind because, uh, you know, the, the rules are changing every day. So this, this is my daily, daily work right now. Okay, that's very interesting to hear. And uh, of course, I believe topic, topic we all want to forget about and don't speak about it anymore. However, we still cannot move, move on and uh, have to deal with it anyway. So COVID-19, how do you do your daily tasks uh, in this field? I believe that it's also related uh, with, to your uh, position, right? No, absolutely. And I mean, honestly, like, like all of us, see, we were, all, were caught by surprise. Like I remember those days, like back in March, um, if I remember correctly, it was March 16 or 17. Uh, we were just asked to go and start working from, from home. And of course, we thought it's going to take maybe a few weeks, maybe a month. <laughs> Nobody thought that it's going to be a year-long project. And eventually, um, uh, I started, I, I volunteered within the legal department to review the rules for COVID, uh, to, to pro, you know, to protect against the COVID risks. And uh, right now, I mean, there are four lawyers in the legal department who are working on uh, different regulations. So let's yeah. say... Um, we in the beginning we expected that it's going to be a federal standard for the COVID rules, and as you know, like uh, there was no there was no federal standard. There was some guidance of central authority, but uh, you know all the states they enacted their own rules, and eventually there were counties and there were cities who had like a different rules. So we had to monitor all of them. Like for example, mm -hmm. right now, uh, California each county has a different capacity limits for the retail stores. Like some mm -hmm. stores could have like 20%, some 50%, you know, some like even less. And you have to monitor those because we may not allow uh, more of our employees and customers to enter the store. Mm -hmm. So we had to develop like multiple um, 
programs internally. Let's say uh, we, we, we develop the COVID prevention plan, make sure that it is safe uh, for our employees to be in the stores. Of mm -hmm. course, uh, when we have a positive case, we have to make sure that people notify about the positive case because we have to identify close contacts. So mm -hmm. also like that, uh, we had to develop notification policy and eventually um, in US it is mandatory to, to monitor for, um, uh, you know, for the symptoms. So we developed a health assessment questionnaire, you know, paper and mobile, then mm -hmm. uh, also employees are me measuring their temperatures. And of course, there is a tendency to disclose as much information as possible. And my task, of course, is to push back because we have to notify the local local health authorities about positive cases from the stores. Like right now in California, we have to notify an outbreak. If we have three or more cases in one location, we have to provide you know personal details. So we try to avoid disclosing like unnecessary details. Let's say very precise uh, physical location because they just mm -hmm. need to know where the positive test was conducted. Um, and of course, right now it's a huge debate on the vaccination policy. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it is uh, it is debated whether it should be mandatory or only encouraged. If it is mandatory, it has a lot of um, you know legal compliance issues. For example, mm -hmm. like uh, what if there's going to be some you know adverse effects related to vaccine, and, and the company said it is mandatory, then you are liable. So I mean, it's a very interesting field. It's not only I would say privacy. But there are like a lot of implications on the employment law as well. Yeah, but it's definitely highly linked to privacy because when you say that uh, even detailed physical location of an employee is traced and you have to disclose it, so this means that it's highly linked to privacy regulations. Is there are there any benchmarks or guidances on how to deal with these issues when you collect uh, employment employment related data of, of, of your employees? When it comes to regulations and coordination with data privacy standards, do you have any kind of guidance there on that? Honestly, it, did, it developed like too fast. <laughs> like nobody, yeah. nobody was ready. So you try to apply uh, general principles. Of course, there is like a HIPAA, Health Insurance uh, Portability Accountability Act, but it is applicable to health authorities, not for like regular businesses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you try to implement different principles based on those laws in in you know private setting, mm -hmm. uh, but it is. It is hard and you know also like sometimes the guidance is inconsistent you would be amazed that most likely you've heard stories about uh, mandatory masks like face covering yeah. and only only encouraged so sometimes you have a uh, uh, the state governor who says it is mandatory and the city says like no <laughs> you should not <laughs> wear a mask <laughs> so it gets a little bit like political as well so i mean eventually we do our best uh, to monitor the new rules once they are published and to advise the business and I think for me, it was a very exciting project because um, I feel very close to the business because mm -hmm. basically they need to react tomorrow and they look for our guidance, our retail, retail um, store employees. So as a lawyer, I feel like quite empowered and, and it is important what we do because, uh, you know, first of all, we need to be compliant and second of all, you know, we want to make uh, our employees safe. Sure, and I see a lot of uh, similarities here because when you say that you got home at uh, on the March 16th, uh, I believe it's the same uh, around the same time when it's also in Lithuania. So I see a lot of similarities when you say that the rules are really inconsistent. You know, on, on, on one page you can see that something is uh, mandatory, and then on the other side you, you can see that it's something you know recommended but not mandatory. So it's it's very difficult to to navigate these uh, regulations, and I believe that it's especially important and difficult when you have um, different regimes and different uh, jurisdictions uh, on your map. So um, how do you see the practical differences between the data protection regimes in Europe and the US? What are the main obstacles when doing an international business, which you know covers uh, multiple nationalities and multiple jurisdictions and regulations? I would say, first of all, I always look at the outset because, you know, originally I was a European trained lawyer, so I understood data protection as part of like, a, you know, constitutional right because of historical reasons. I mean, it's very important. It's part of, you know, all the European conventions, uh, while in the US it is seen more as an economic right, although uh, there are, uh, you know, there are certain state constitutions where they have uh, data, uh, you know, right to privacy in, in embedded in their constitutions. Still, it is more like state-by-state state approach. 
and U.S. law was developed as well, more like as a sectorial law. Let's say you protect, you know, financial privacy, you protect like health privacy. Uh, so California was the first um, like comprehensive uh, U.S. state privacy law. And as you know, right now it's like it's like, like version two, so CPRA, California Privacy Rights Act, which actually um, took certain principles from GDPR. So, you know, I see a lot of, first of all, I see a lot of convergence between different privacy laws. Uh, also, for example, you know, right now there is a bill of China Personal Information Protection Act, and they have um, right to access and deletion, right to be forgotten. So they took certain concepts from European laws into China's laws. Uh, I see in the CPRA, for example, California's Privacy Rights Act, uh, principle of data minimization and purpose limitation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think bits and pieces like privacy by design is taken from like European concepts and embedded in different laws. Uh, but of course, there are unique features. Like, let's say you asked about the difference between EU and US. Mm -hmm. You know, US is a very litigious society. And of course, first thing is like private right of action. So there is a lot of debate, like what's, you know, where is the scope of private right of action? Because businesses are afraid of, of huge, you know, huge claims. And CCPA private right of action is limited to data breaches. So this means that, uh, you know, protection data, embedding security is very important because you want to avoid that, you know, that claim. Uh, what I like as well, like uh, in US you have a 30 day QR period. So before getting sanctioned, which is you know quite famous in Europe, that you get like a huge sanction under the GDPR, mm -hmm. you have 30 days to mitigate you know the risks to being compliant uh, without getting fines first. So I mean, I like I like when it is more business friendly, when you get clarity what is the law, because I remember like first days when GDPR came into force, like a lot of U.S. businesses they don't really uh, know how to implement the rules. There was like two years grace period to prepare for it. And for example, in California, once the CPA came into force, there were two years, um, oh, sorry, there were like a lot of implementing regulations. There were like three versions of implementing regulations. And still after like three versions, there were many questions. So I think it's very important to discuss between like legislature and business to understand the rules better. So my last question, uh, today we heard uh, many insights on uh, how the future of data protection shall look like. Well, in your opinion, uh, what do you believe will be the key factors uh, shaping the future of uh, privacy? Is it uh, all about technology, is it all about regulation, or all about us, individuals? I think it's, it's all. I, I believe like when people say like privacy doesn't really matter and you lost the fight, I don't think it's true. I, I think every one of us uh, uh, expects privacy. I mean, personally, I'm, I know the rules, but I, I still have like private sphere of my affairs, you know, what I don't want to share it. So I don't think it's going to change. Um, people like to be private, but I think what's inevitable, the use of technology, like we felt through COVID that it's like everywhere. <laughs> and it's great, actually, it, it brings a lot of benefits. I don't say that it has to be like wild, wild west, that Basically, you can do anything what you want with any data. I think it has to be a compliance. It has to be a certain level. And first, we're going to use more and more of technology. But second, uh, you have to be transparent what you do with technology. And you have to respect the customers. I think that's very important in the tapestry as well. Like we try to honor data subject requests like immediately because, you know, Customers are not are not silly. They are smart. They know, you know, what can they do with the data. They want to get tailored, you know, messages. They want to know, you know, uh, and of course they don't want to to get like too many, you know, email marketings. So they want to be empowered to avoid that. So I think you you have to basically respect the customer, but you have to explain to them how you use the data. And I feel that privacy laws are going that direction. I mean, they give certain rights to the customers. Let's say in California, you have a right to opt out from data sale, which is defined like very broadly. Basically, mm -hmm. you can opt out from sharing of personal information with third parties. Before it was the right to, you know, to share with third parties for their marketing purposes. Right now under the CPRA, uh, there is actually the distinction between regular data and sensitive data, like in Europe. And then eventually you can opt out from 
secondary use of sensitive data. So it gives more and more rights to the customers to be like to manage, you know, their personal information. Of course, technology will help with that because I know like only in the privacy field, like from International Association of Privacy Professionals are like thousands of vendors who are trying to help with that. But I think the law is going to that direction. Use of technology, you know, and transparency, what you do with the data. And I think third, I've seen many companies are seeing uh, robust privacy protection as competitive advantage. Like the best examples, of course, like Microsoft, um, you know, Apple, where they claim that your data is private, and we're gonna add additional precautions to make sure that you feel, you know, comfortable of using our products. And they try to differentiate in the market, you know, place, you know, uh, providing additional attention to privacy. And I, I hope that there's gonna be more and more companies who who will do it proactively rather than reactively. You know, when they get the fine, then they implement, you know the privacy measures, I hope that they're going to see it more as a competitive advantage as a corporate culture to protect, you know, privacy of their employees and customers. Thank you very much, Gedminas, for your insights. It was really, really helpful and really interesting to hear. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today from uh, very far away. <laughs> and um, good luck with your role, good luck with your challenges. And I hope we have a chance to hear from you more in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.